know everything about boxing. We are not talking about the rankings or the fights. Boxing has secrets that would mess with your brain. It has secrets so dark, only a few certain people have heard them. Today, here at Boxing Matrix, we will go through the darkest secrets of the sport. Stay until the end. You will not regret this. This is Boxing Matrix. Enjoy this video. Our video starts with Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray's record was 128-1-2, with 84 knockouts at the pinnacle of his career. Amazingly, in over 200 fights, Sugar Ray was never physically knocked out. Although he amassed 109 KOs and finished with a record of 175-19-6 with two no decisions, even champion Muhammad Ali called him the king. The master, my idol. Ray Robinson was the greatest fighter pound for pound, meaning that I imagine if he was a heavyweight fighting the same style, he'd be the greatest. I would have to admit, I would have to say yes. I have his fight films, I've watched the film. That man was beautiful, timing, speed, reflexes, rhythm, every body, everything was beautiful. I say I'm the greatest heavyweight of all times, but pound for pound, I still say Sugar Ray Robinson was the greatest of all times. On the 26th of June, 1947, Sugar Ray Robinson was scheduled to fight 22-year-old Jimmy Doyle. In his autobiography, Robinson told the chilling story of a dream he had prior to his bout with Doyle. In his dream, Robinson was fighting Jimmy Doyle. Ray lands a devastating strike, knocking Jimmy to the canvas. Jimmy lays there, unable to rise. He said, I woke up in a cold sweat, yelling for Jimmy to get up, get up, get up. My yelling woke me up, I guess. In the dream, Jimmy Doyle was in the ring with Ray Robinson. He hit him a few good punches and he was on his back, his blank eyes staring up at Robinson, and he was staring down at him, not knowing what to do. And the referee was moving in to count to ten, with Doyle still not moving a muscle. All he could hear was the crowd yelling. Robinson was so disturbed by the dream that he wanted to back out of the fight with Doyle. Fight promoters, who stood to lose money by Robinson's decision, brought in a Catholic priest who sought to calm Robinson's nerves by assuring him that it was only a dream. The night before the fight with him, I, I dreamed in my sleep that I knocked him out and he died in the ring. And I got up that morning and I told the commission that I wasn't going to fight. And they said, why? And I told them what I had dreamed down the they said, oh, Ray, no, that's just a dream. And they called a, a Catholic priest and a minister. And they came and they talked to me and told me to go ahead with the fight. And just like we dreamed, Aldo, I hit him a left hook and he died right there. The promoter Larry Atkins convinced Robinson not to cancel the fight because of a dream. The fight happened, and in the eighth round, Robinson landed a left hook to the face of Doyle. The punch sent Doyle to the canvas. Referee Jackie Davis began the 10 count, but soon realized that it wasn't necessary. Doyle was unconscious. He died the next day. Immediately after the fight, a shocked and dazed Robinson informed reporters of his premonition by dream, letting out a good deal of emotion he had managed to bottle up as he engaged in the fight he strongly felt in his heart would end in tragedy. Robinson was clearly haunted by the fight. He said, I had knocked out guys before, dozens of them, but in those fights I always had a good feeling, a conquering feeling when I saw them being counted out maybe because I could see that they weren't really hurt. But now, with Doyle stretched out and his eyes blank, I have that empty feeling you get when something in your life is really wrong. And all I could think of was the dream. You warned me, God. Robinson donated every single penny he made off of the fight to Doyle's mother in order for her to buy a house, which is what her son wanted the most. I had the premonition before that this was gonna happen. And for a long time, although I couldn't fight, I couldn't fight when I started again, I, was, I couldn't hit a man hard, you know. The IBF Incident In boxing, there are four major world championship governing bodies. The WBC, WBA, WBO, and IBF. The IBF is one of the younger governing bodies. 
beginning operations in 1984, their rankings in championship title shots were almost immediately paid for by $338,000 in bribes. The IBF's rankings would depend on the merit of the boxers in their particular division, but fighters with a big pocket promoter, like the evil Don King, could pay to advance. Or big enough that uh, people want to come and see, and then you construct a business deal around that attraction so that you can make money for the people that are participating and make some for yourself. Yeah. Now, let's bribes from big promoters ensured their fighters stayed ranked above other fighters just getting by. This scheme would go on for over 13 years before an investigation was made, and IBF President Robert Lee was arrested, along with three other officials who were charged with taking bribes. Over 23 boxers and seven promoters, including Don King and top ranks Bob Arum, were revealed to have been involved in fights tainted by bribes. Arum said he paid $100,000 in 1995 to have George Foreman not have to face his mandatory. The IBF fed Foreman Alex Schulz, who was defeated by majority decision. 14, 114, he has it even. Jerry Roth scores the bout. 115 to 113. Keith McDonald scores it. 115 to 113 for the winner by majority decision. And still, heavyweight champion of the world, Big George Forma. In the end, Lee was convicted on bribery charges and served 22 months in prison and paid $25,000 in fines. Our next story again includes a promoter, the most evil person in the boxing industry, Don King. Don King seized the opportunity to start the United States Boxing Championships in 1976 when America was celebrating its bicentennial and the U.S. Olympic boxing team had just scored five gold medals. Don King pulls off the biggest fight in goddamn history, and still, I couldn't get no respect. Oh, sure, I had my pictures in the paper, but nobody wanted to do business. Bob Aaron and all them racist white men, they put on their pointy hoods and started spreading falsehoods about me, trying to diminish and besmirchify my accomplishments. King sold the idea of the United States Boxing Championship Tournament to ABC to broadcast. The tournament would be filled with bums and journeymen that needed validation. That's where the Ring magazine came in. The Ring's rankings were bought by King, who recognized that the Ring had been dropping in subscriptions every year since 1962. Ring got the publicity of a big Don King tournament, and Don King got his fighters the validation they needed in order to market and justify his events. Influential devil motherfucker. Man takes a bite out of somebody and you want to blame me for not feeding them properly. Let me tell you something. Mike Tyson will fight again, and you'll pay to see him. Deep investigative reporting from boxing journalists who grew suspicious of the dearth of quality opposition in these bouts exposed King. Soon, word that at least 11 fighters participating in the tournament had falsified records got out, and ABC became worried. After a participant in the tournament came clean about many of the fights being rigged to give victories to the fighters who had contracts with King, ABC finally canceled the tournament. King would let some of his associates receive the legal blowback, and he escaped unscathed. Some say the scandal hurt to ring's credibility so bad that the WBC and WBA sanctioning bodies were given more power and authority from the incident, thus the later creation of the IBF and WBO. I can do the math, baby, but I only cleared 15. Well, where does 20? <laughs> Come on, baby, you think I tried to cheat you motherfuckers? The next one on the list is Carlos Monzon and his dirty sin. Carlos Monzon was arguably the greatest Argentine boxer of all time, and the greatest middleweight of all time. 
In 1977, Monzon retired and managed to keep out of the papers. His previous violent relationships, that at least once, resulted in his being shot in the leg by an ex-wife, became the stuff that the paparazzi ate up. But in 1988, Monzon entered the mainstream press again. This time, he not only beat his wife, Alicia Munoz, he picked her up by the neck and threw her off the second floor balcony of their apartment. Monzon was convicted of homicide and sentenced to 11 years. Monzon was allowed to visit his family in 1995 for a weekend, only to crash his car and die on the way back. I beat all my women, Monzon said, and nothing ever happened to them. Muniz's mother would call him a murderer, stating that he threatened her daughter on numerous occasions. The incident brought to light how domestic violence was always a taboo subject in Argentina a country without a single home for battered women. On the 16th of June, 1983, boxing fans gathered at Madison Square Garden in New York witnessed one of the most tragic and shameful episodes in the modern history of the sport, the fight between Luis Resto and Billy Collins Jr. Resto, almost intact and apparently stronger than his contender believed, won by unanimous decision of the judges and against all odds. That night, Madison Square Garden was completely full, and no one could believe that a fighter with a mediocre record would have managed to shoot down a golden boy that everyone imagined would have no problem getting the victory. Billy's father, a former boxer who served as his son's coach, approached the winner to congratulate him and to shake his hand. He understood unintentionally and by chance that something was wrong with those gloves. Refusing to release the opponent, he asked the commissioner of the fight to examine them. He was yelling that they had removed all the padding. Resto did not seem surprised by the accusations, nor was he trying to understand what Collins Sr. was talking about. The fighter looked to his corner, where his handler was, with a scared and fearful look that seemed to reveal that he had resorted to a ruse. Anyway, he and his coach reacted at that moment by repeating over and over again to the authority that those gloves had been received to them from the organizers. Lewis and his pupil wanted to get out of the arena unseen, but the referee for the evening led them to the locker room and was the first to examine the gloves. After touching them, he was completely sure that the filler had been stolen, a criminal decision taking into account that in a violent and contact sport such as boxing, a blow under these conditions is not only advantageous for the tipper, but it can be lethal for the recipient. Billy's fate was much more tragic, and his life was never the same since that June 16th. The beating he received when he was physically beaten practically by bare hand for almost half an hour, beyond the impressive bruises on his eyes, caused him a tear of the iris that forced him to abandon his promising career so as not to go completely blind. His condition prevented him from working and led to depression and restlessness that alienated him from his wife and newborn daughter, and they threw him into the drink. Nine months later, on March 7, 1984, Collins crashed into his car and passed away at the age of 22. The decision was unanimous in favor of Luis Resto, but shortly after the fight, Collins' handlers charged that Resto's gloves had been tampered with, that some of the required padding had been secretly and illegally removed, adding extra impact to Resto's punches. The New York State Athletic Commission apparently was suspicious, and they impounded Luis Resto's gloves. A tragedy like no other. Another manslaughter inside the ring, showing that boxing isn't a game. In 1982, Ray Mancini fought Duck Koo Kim in a defense of the WBA lightweight title. Mancini was a well-experienced fighter, but Duck Koo Kim had never been in a 15-round fight before. Kim displayed world-class toughness by coming back from some major punishment. Then. In round 14, Mancini decked Kim with a short combination that Kim almost got up from, but the referee waved off the fight.
Kim would die of brain injuries related to the fight four days later. Mancini would never be the same aggressive fighter he had become famous for. Boxing also would never be the same. Every sanctioning body lowered the championship limit from 15 rounds to 12 by the end of the 1980s in an effort to make the sport safer. Dukku Kim's mother, who had flown to the U.S. to spend the final moments by her son's side before he died, died by suicide three months later by drinking a bottle of pesticide. Referee Richard Green died by suicide on July 1, 1983. Ray Mancini blamed himself for Kim's death and fell into a depression. A brutal beatdown. Emil Griffith and Benny the Kid Paray were welterweight rivals, trading the world championship back and forth through their first two fights, only to settle the score on March 24th, 1962. The fight was televised nationally on ABC and was fought in the famous Madison Square Garden. The fight was a competitive one until round 12, when Griffith knocked Paré into the ropes. Griffith hit Paré 20 times, with Paré becoming unconscious during the end of the exchange. Paret against the ropes, almost helpless. A minute to go. And they're going to stop it. They're going to stop it as Paret sags to the canvas. Paret goes down from sheer exhaustion. Look at him there. As a result, many networks ended their national broadcasts of boxing until the Ali Frazier era of the 1970s. The event represented a shift in how the sport stopped its fights, with referees becoming increasingly safety conscious with each passing decade. A dirty story showing how the mob controlled everything in the 1900s. In 1947, Jank LaMotta was a great boxer on the rise but he was looking for a greater rise and favor with the mob. The mob controlled boxing and wanted LaMotta to take a dive against Billy Fox for an extra $20,000 and a guaranteed title shot against Frenchman Marcel Cerdan. LaMotta tried to hit him and Fox's knees went weak. LaMotta carried him in what increasingly became an obvious fix. By round four, the fix was obvious and LaMotta lay against the ropes to allow the light-hitting Fox to pounce on him. Fox was awarded the fourth round TKO. LaMotta was awarded his promised 20 grand and title shot, as well as an investigation from the FBI years later. Set him up with some mob figures, but LaMotta didn't want anything to do with them, not trusting them or anyone else. He earned his reputation as a tough guy in his first year as a pro, facing 21-fight veteran Jimmy Reeves. Don King and his robberies. In 1972, Don King organized a charity boxing match featuring Muhammad Ali to benefit Forest City Hospital, an underfunded care center outside King's hometown of Cleveland. On the surface, it sounds like a pretty proud moment for the boxing promoter, until you look at the books. The fight I want to make is Ali Foreman. Ali? Don, that, that's way out of our league. Let's concentrate out on Out of my what, baby? Let, it, it, let's and I ain't nothing out of my league, baby. I didn't mean any disrespect. On an episode of the ESPN series Sports Century, Don Elbaum, a former boxing promoter, alleged that of the $85,000 the event made in ticket sales, the hospital received $1,500. An absurd 83% of the purse was pretty much a standard cut for King, but that's grimy as hell when you're working for charity. Now let us tell you that this wasn't the only time the boxing promoter stole money. After a title bout with Jerry Cooney, Larry Holmes was shortchanged some $300,000 by King. A few years later, while King was managing Michael Jackson's victory tour, Holmes sued King for a flagrant and fraudulent attempt to withhold a large sum of money. Holmes would later settle for a paltry $100,000. Also, out of all the fighters he could steal money from, he picked Tyson. It's not a great idea to anger Mike, who's famous for biting a man's ear off. Don King learned this lesson the hard way. When Mike Tyson discovered more than $20 million in missing assets, he tracked down Don King and beat him into the pavement outside a Los Angeles hotel. 
And um, I get in the back. Jackie gets in the front. And the girl I'm with, she gets in the back with me. And then Dante, Dante took, hey, man, yeah, man, we won't get this money. Fuck these white motherfuckers, man. It'll be me and two niggas. And for some reason, I just, I don't know. I just, I'm in the back of the road with and I just kick the boom. And it stops. It's on the 15, you know, with the highway. 15, yeah, yeah. 15 in Miami. South. Yeah. And um, I, oh, it was just bad. Right? It, was, it just was bad. It was bad. So. And now, a sad and tragic story. Edwin Valero was an exciting super featherweight and lightweight world champion. He was an animal in the ring, knocking out every single one of his 27 opponents, the first 18 within round one. He was set to take the limelight away from the likes of Manny Pacquiao with his exciting style, until he was arrested on suspicion of murdering his wife in April of 2010. While in jail, Valero was found hanging from a bar in his cell with a noose made from his sweatpants. The exciting champion had committed suicide. Valero's Venezuelan family and friends were skeptical of Valero's death being suicide, suggesting the police had him murdered. Even the president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, suggested that Valero and his wife were killed by enemies of the state. None of these claims, true or not, nullify the fact that boxing lost a great champion. Valero had previously been accused of attacking his mother and sister in an incident in 2007, which he later denied. Valero was undefeated in his near eight-year career, most recently defeating Antonio DeMarco this past February. He used his own clothes to hang himself in a Venezuelan prison cell with his body discovered early Monday morning with officers unable to revive him. Valero had two children, a seven-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter. A disgusting crime in the sport of boxing. Antonio Margarito had just come off his inspiring 2008 TKO of previously undefeated Miguel Cotto, the former welterweight world champ, when he met Shane Mosley in January of 2009. Mosley's trainer, Nazim Richardson, noticed a powdery substance in Margarito's gloves. When this substance was brought to the attention of officials, Margarito was made to rewrap his gloves three times. The substance turned out to be the plaster of Paris, a powder that would harden when wet. When applied to hand wraps, sweat would make the powder harden into the equivalent of a cast. Mosley would go on to knock Margarito out in brutal fashion, and Margarito would be banned from the sport for a year. Up against the ropes, and a right, and another right, and finally Margarito goes down. He is hurt severely. He sees the referee and he is up in time. In the aftermath of the discovery of Margarito's plaster, many have questioned his 2008 clash with Kato and some of his other victories, and the sport of boxing took another blow to its credibility. Afterwards, Capetillo claimed he used the hardened pads to protect another fighter's hands in training, and they had been mistakenly placed in Margarito's wraps on fight night without the boxer's knowledge. When I spoke with Capetillo, pues... Solamente él me dijo que había sido un error. Le dije, pero, pues, ¿qué tipo de error? Porque dicen que, que hay yeso. Y dijo, no hay yeso. Y dije, bueno, pues, lo que digan que hay... Me dijo, fue un error mío. Me dijo, y la verdad, lo siento mucho. No, no pensé que llegara a todo esto. Y... Shane Mosley's part in Scandals doesn't end here. In 2003, Mosley testified in front of a federal jury that he used EPO in his second fight with Oscar De La Hoya. EPO can increase an athlete's endurance, affecting the later part of a fight, often called the championship rounds. Mosley would win his fight by close decision. The testimony showed that Mosley evaded the Las Vegas Commission's drug testing program and fooled millions of fans. Mosley was an upstanding citizen, and a scandal of this nature forever ruined his nice guy that hits hard image. Boxing is a sport that's brutal and bloody. To cheat in such a dangerous sport plays with the lives of other competitors. Well, the injection was EPO, right? It was EPO, yes. And you knew it was EPO that day, correct? Um, I, yeah, I guess I, I knew it was something, yeah. Once again on our list is Don King. The man really can't keep himself out of trouble. Did you know that Don King had killed two people? Well, King controlled one of the biggest rackets in Cleveland, and in 1954, he shot and killed a man named Hillary Brown, who was said to be trying to rob one of King's gambling houses.
Okay, I'm ready. Go on. Take your best shot. Like those motherfuckers back in 54. When the case went to court, Don King claimed that he had killed Brown in self-defense. The court agreed with his argument, and he walked free due to the ruling of justifiable homicide. On the 20th of April 1966, Don King, still in the numbers game, got into an altercation with one of his employees, a 34-year-old man named Sam Garrett. King claimed that Garrett owed him $900, while Garrett said he only owed his boss $600. The two fought in the street, and although the exact details of the fight vary, according to Film Daily, some witnesses said that they saw King kick Garrett in the head at least three times, and also struck him with a 38 caliber revolver before being pulled off of him by two Cleveland detectives. Garrett died in the hospital five days later. First blood, baby. Man, I thought my number was up. That shit never went to trial, though. Rude to justifiable homicide in defense of self. Shit, even a white DA could see that. Oh yeah, baby. I ducked more punches than Muhammad Ali. Took more too. I went up against them all in where to now. <laughs> this was our video for the darkest secrets in boxing's history. We really hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. Remember, you don't play boxing. This is Boxing Matrix. Thank you for watching.